Join me today as we unravel the mystery of the Oakland County child killer, a case that shook Michigan to its core in the 1970s. Discover the truth behind the brutal murders of Mark Stebbins, Joel Robinson, Christine Mielich, and Timothy King, and the desperate efforts of law enforcement to bring the killer to justice. From ransom requests to constitutional violations, this case has it all. But the biggest question remains, who was the babysitter killer? Well, keep watching to find out and be prepared for a reveal that will leave you questioning everything you thought you knew. Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of The Casual Criminalist. I, as always, am your host Simon. What did you think of my cold open? I was like, I wanted to do like, introduce these with a hook that gets people excited and I felt like that old school, you know, like they do on TV shows previously on Lost or, you know, this season on so and so. I just thought it would be like an interesting way to say, is it too cheesy? Maybe it's too cheesy. Look, welcome to the show. I'm your host Simon. What happens here, one of my writers in this case, Kevin, has written me a script. It's all about the Oakland County child killer, so uh, cheery subject for today's episode, but you're tuning into a True crime show so cheery is honestly not why you're here is it you dark dark soul you um let's just jump in shall we thank you kevin for writing thank you jen, jen on the clock who does the wonderful editing work on this and let's go mark stebbins mark stebbins was a 12-year-old boy living in ferndale michigan as always to help out simon michigan is considered a midwestern state chicago michigan Midwest. Midwest. Chicago. Where's Chicago? I feel like I know where Chicago is. It's kind of in the middle. That feels right. Chicago, Michigan. Detroit, Michigan? Is Michigan a city or a state? Oh my god, Simon, you small brain. I don't expect myself to have a great knowledge of American geography, but I feel like I should... That, that feels like something I should know. Let, let's carry on. It's the one that borders Canada and has Great Lakes. Mark was a quiet kid and a loner, but a good student. On the afternoon of February the 15th, 1970... Next time, Kevin, just put a map in there, mate. It's it's the future. We're not... You, you know, you're not like, oh, I don't want to print colour. Just stick a map in there for me. It's fine. Just stick a screenshot of Google Maps and be like, boom, Michigan. Easy. No, no, because I'm not a painter. I'm a writer. On the afternoon of February the 15th, 1976, he was at the American Legion Hall, where his mother worked as a bartender. Unsurprisingly, early afternoon at a bar is not a very exciting place for a 12-year-old to hang out, so at 1.30pm he got bored and told his mother he was going to walk home. When Mark's mother returned home that night, she asked his brother Michael if he had come home. He hadn't, so she called her ex-husband to see if Mark had gone there instead, which he had not. Oh my god. Kevin. Ah, oh, s***. Here we go again. This is already so dark, and I'm already getting into that dark place where I'm like, I have uh, kids, and it's like, no, don't walk home by yourself, you're 12, and you'd be like, 12? I would walk to school by myself when I was 12, and I wouldn't think twice about it, and would I let my kids walk to, to school when they're 12? And I'd be like, yeah, I guess so, but now I'm like, well, I don't want them to get murdered, and I know Mark's gonna get murdered. Oh God! Death is just another part. Oh, shut up, will you? At 11 p.m. that night, she called the police department to report her son missing. Four days later, a man was walking his dog through the parking lot of an office building at around 9:30 a.m. The dog was on 20-foot leash, so it had plenty of room to run around and investigate anything interesting that it happened to see or smell. Jesus, 20-foot leash? Why use a leash at all? That's massive. Oh no, that's 20 yards. I'm thinking of yards. <laughs> Oh, that's not too bad. I'm just converting it into meters in my head because, you know, I'm a modern man. Um, yeah, that's not too bad. This didn't happen and the man and the dog continued on their walk. Very exciting stuff, I know. At 11.45 that same morning, Mark Botigheimer emerged from the office to walk to a nearby drugstore on his lunch break. Oh, I see why we included the story about the dog, because that's going to be there wasn't anything interesting there at that point. But then this Mark dude's going to walk out. Um, Botigheimer, same name as the victim, first name. Um, and he's going to discover something, isn't he? So we know we've got a rough time frame of when that body was left there, assuming there is a body, which, you know, this is a true crime show. There's going to be a body. Let's go. As he was crossing through the same part of the parking lot, the man had been walking the dog. Something in the corner of the lot caught his eye. It looked like a discarded mannequin, so he walked over to investigate. As he got closer, he could see what it really was. Lying in the parking lot in plain view was the body of Mark Stebbins. There was only a window of a little over two hours in which he could have been placed there. But sadly, these were the days before CCTV cameras were everywhere. Mark was wearing the same clothes as when he disappeared, but freshly washed. The cause of death was suffocation, and there were also rope burns on his wrists, ankles, and neck. Wherever he had been kept for the past four days, he had been bound tightly. The autopsy also revealed that he had been sodomized with a foreign object. Jill Robinson Like Mark, 12-year-old Jill Robinson was described as a loner and a good student. Quiet, 
Not so much. Jill would frequently get into arguments with her mother, Carol, and on the day of December 22, 1976, things were no different. Carol had asked Jill to help her make biscuits for dinner. When she refused, Carol told her to get out of the house until she was ready to be a part of the family. Regrettable last words to say to your child, but they had similar arguments to this in the past, and Carol figured uh, that she would leave for an hour or so and then come home. Jill went upstairs, got dressed for the cold weather, and packed her bag with some clothes and a blanket so that she could do as she was told and run away. She went out the door and rode her bike off. Yeah, this is one thing. Um, I remember, I can't remember what it was. It was definitely when I was a kid, and I heard this thing of, like, don't go to bed angry with someone. Like, and I really apply that like because i don't know it's kind of dark to think that people die in their sleep or this kind of stuff and but you never know what's going to happen and i always feel like when i'm leaving someone for a, a time whether that's to be unconscious or to like go to work or ever i really try to not leave thing not like not be angry at that person like or upset or for it's not angry but like to have had an argument with my wife or something and then to like i don't like leaving it on that because then you're like I don't know, is it super morbid? Is that super morbid? I don't know, I've had just like people unexpectedly die in my life and you don't want it to be like that to be the last thing that, that happens. Honestly, I don't really remember the last thing that happened to the people who like died in my life. So maybe I wouldn't even remember. But I also feel like I would if it was an argument and then you'd be like, man, that's not cool. Anyway, let's uh, let's move on from this. Oh God, it's so morbid already. <laughs> Why, Simon? Why is this the first thing you record at nine o'clock on a Wednesday morning? <laughs> Why? Sometimes you just gotta do it because it's your job. Jill's parents were also divorced, so when we say she was running away, she was most likely just planning to make the five or six mile bike ride to her father's house. The average bike speed for a 12 year old is about nine miles per hour, so it's not really that far, assuming she knew her way there. Shortly after she left her house, Jill was seen at the local hobby shop just four and a half blocks from her home. Her bike would be found behind the store the next day. As we said, Carol expected her daughter to return home in an hour or two, so when several hours passed, she finally called Jill's father, Thomas. She had never made it to his house, so at 11.30, he called the police to report her missing. Christmas came and went. Jill had been particularly excited for Christmas because she had been able to buy presents for her family on her own, but all of the family's presents sat under the tree, still wrapped. Her mother and two sisters didn't want to have a Christmas without her. The next day, her body was found on I-75, Troy, Michigan. She was also left out in the open, this time in view of the Troy police station. She was wearing the same clothes and backpack as when she ran away. She had been taken to this location, where she was then shot in the face at close range with a shotgun. She's 11. I... Yeah, let's just carry on. At first, police were not sure that these crimes were related. One was a male victim who was bound, sexually assaulted, and asphyxiated. The other was a female victim who showed no signs of being restrained, was not sexually assaulted, and was shot. On the surface, the only similarity was that they were young kids who disappeared and were found four days later in plain view. That's something to take note of for sure, but it's not a clear link. However, the public felt differently. While police insisted there was not a serial killer on the loose, the population of Oakland County wasn't convinced. People were scared, but it was only after the next victim that full-blown panic would ensue. Don't worry, Simon, there's only like 30 or 40 more of these before we get to the investigation. Oh, God. Christine Mierlich Christine Mierlich was a 10-year-old girl from Berkeley, Michigan. On January 2, 1977, she complained to her mother, Deborah, that she was bored and wanted to go to 7-Eleven to buy a magazine. Normally, Deborah would never let her cross 12 Mile Road on her own, but because Christine had helped out with some chores earlier, her mother relented. She instructed Christine on how to cross the street, and she told her to hurry. When Christine failed to return within 30 minutes, her mother called the police. She had disappeared in broad daylight without a trace. I feel like this is it. Uh, it's the future. I feel like, okay, I gotta get those GPS chips implanted under my children's skin. Wanna watch Black Mirror? I know that sounds intense, and I know it, I said it as a joke, but if that was possible, I'm pretty sure that I would do that. Like, if they could just have, like, a vaccine or whatever, you know, and have one of those Bill Gates 5G chips put into them. And as long as I had access to it, I'd be perfectly down with that. And just to be clear, I absolutely think that's a conspiracy theory, but I'd be grateful if that technology could exist. Like, and it would be turned off. Like, I'd turn it off the majority of the time. But when something like this happens, even if I had to call the police in order to turn it on, or call, like, an independent company who would, like, judge whether it was right for me to be able to track the person at that moment, then I think this would be a really useful technology to have. 
Like, I give... Uh, I haven't done it yet, but I bought some air tags so I can give my children these little bracelets. So now they're all just running wild. You're like, oh god, okay. Um, so they can have those. But then if they get kidnapped, someone's going to take that off. Whereas if they've got, like, a secret chip under their skin... This is sounding so crazy and so helicopter parents, but it's just like, I don't want it to see where they are and whether they're, like, you know, smoking behind the bike shed or whatever children do these days. Like, I just want it for a situation like this. Is that so wrong? I want that. <laughs> And until they're 18, I, I think I'm allowed. Come on. Look at him, he's traumatized. And I'm not saying I'll do it when they're like 16 or 17, but these this is like a 10-year-old who's getting kidnapped and murdered. When Christine failed to return within 30 minutes, her mother called the police. She had disappeared in broad daylight without a trace. As she continued to remain missing for days, tensions quickly began rising. Deborah's friends and neighbors raised $17,000 in the hopes that a ransom request would come in, with many offering to mortgage their houses as well. The only way Deborah could cope with her child being missing and not having any answers was stressy to the point of gaining 30 pounds during a disappearance. And the whole time, she had to try and ignore her two younger sons who kept asking when Christine was coming home. After an excruciating 19 days, they'd finally get the answer. Never. A postman in Franklin Village, Michigan, was driving the same route he had for eight years when he saw something on the side of the road on Bruce Lane and decided to take a look. He frequently would pick up things that people had thrown out as junk, and perhaps whatever had caught his eye might be something he could make use of or pawn off at a flea market. Instead, what he saw was the body of Christine. Her legs were tucked up towards her chest, indicating she was carried from the car in the same way a parent would carry their child. The killer had then crossed her arms, laid her in the snow, and packed snow on top of her, as evident by fairly obvious handprints. Like Mark, Christina died of suffocation, and like both others, she was wearing the same clothes that she had on when she disappeared. Despite being missing for 19 days, the autopsy showed that she'd been dead for less than 24 hours by the time she was found. All three missing children had been bathed, fed, and their clothes had been washed. News outlets at the time described them as having been well cared for, which if you consider the sexual abuse to one of them and the shotgun to the face of another, then sure, I guess. Sarcasm, obviously. But it was because the children were fed, washed, and given clean clothing that the media started referring to the culprit as the babysitter killer. And now the time was for panic to ensue. Parents were terrified. Even those that only lived a block away from their child's school would drop them off and pick them up at the doors of the school. Children weren't let out of their parents' sight. A total of 35 police officers from nine different departments made up a task force that the county prosecutor called, quote, the strongest effort I've ever seen in this county. Once the FBI got involved, it would become the largest task force the entire country had ever seen up to that point. Excellent. Let's get cracking. I like it. Let's go, police. Police staked out Christine's funeral, running the license plate of every single person who showed up, though nothing would come of this. Another possible lead was the fact that her body was found on Bruce Lane. At the time, a local psychiatrist, Dr. Bruce Leonard Danto, was doing a lot of interviews to talk about the case and his opinions on the killer. It is believed that Bruce Lane was chosen as Bruce L. represents the doctor's first and middle name. Really, that seems like a bit of a... bit of a stretch. Why? Assuming the 7-Eleven currently on 12 Mile Road had unchanged location, it's only six miles from where Christine's body was found, so there's always the chance it's coincidence. But given that Jill's body was placed in view of a police station, it probably meant was meant as a message. Whether this was an attempt to open up a line of communication or simply taunt the doctor is unknown. Um, oh, I see, because, sorry. I'm sorry, so there must have been victims um before and then the, the the doctor the psychiatrist had started talking about it and then the final victim was dumped on that lane as a message maybe i'm skeptical i generally lean towards coincidence and um, which i think this is timothy king Timothy King was the final confirmed victim of the Oakland County child killer. If it seemed like a demographic was forming beyond just the age of the victims, Tim broke that mold. The other three victims were all introverted children of divorce, but Tim was a popular athletic kid whose parents were still married. It was the night of March the 16th, 1977, and Tim was about to be home alone for the first time ever. How old was he? How old was he? Kevin doesn't say. Dude. <laughs> I want to know, like what age children are left at home i don't yet know that i guess i was left at home at gosh i don't know i feel like 13 but that feels too young i don't know tim's parents had gone out to dinner at a nearby restaurant leaving tim with his older sister catherine oh, okay so he wasn't really home alone he was home alone with his older sister that's fine he had two older brothers as well one of whom was babysitting a neighbor's kid and the other who was rehearsing a school play catherine was about to go out for the night as well oh okay there we go but first she lent him 30 cents because he wanted to go buy some candy 
It wasn't unusual for Tim to go to the store by himself. It was a trip he'd made many times before. He asked Catherine to leave the door ajar so it'd be easier for him to get back inside. Then he grabbed his skateboard and the football and went to the store while Catherine went on her way. Tim made the trip to the store three blocks away, and at around 8.30 p.m., after purchasing his candy, he left out the back door into the dark parking lot. Thirty minutes later, his parents returned home from dinner to find the door ajar and the house empty. The family called everyone and searched everywhere but there was no sign of Tim. Barry King, Tim's father, made several public pleas to the kidnapper in the hopes that they would maybe let his son go. He also commented on something that seems obvious, but still potentially important in identifying the killer. Barry stated that the week before his disappearance, Tim had told his mother that he wouldn't talk to strangers and that he'd run away from them. These children, who were disappearing, were doing so in public, sometimes in daylight. There was a very good chance that whoever was responsible was someone that might not be seen as a stranger. Even if it wasn't a person they personally knew, the killer could be dressed like a trusted authority figure, such as a police officer. It could have even been another kid, as everything we're taught about stranger danger only applies to adults, not our peers. Yeah, but I don't think an 11 year old is gonna, or like a kid, let's say young teens, mid teens, is capable of this kind of brutality. Also, where are they gonna get a shotgun? It seems, I mean, unless that kid is part of like a ring of kidnapping other children and that just seems like it's a bit of a stretch i mean maybe there's more evidence for this i guess we'll find out another seemingly obvious but important statement came from a neighbor of the king family to quote when it happens to other people you feel sympathy when it strikes your neighborhood you're scared michigan isn't quite in the top 10 states for the most violent crime oh there we go michigan is a state (laughs) not a city got that smooth brain simon but it's pretty close. However, that crime is very disproportionate. About 30% of all violent crime in Michigan takes place in Detroit. Yeah, the one thing I know about Detroit is they make cars, and it's a bit run down and dangerous. Whereas Oakland County is the most affluent county in the state, there's speculation that these crimes were committed as part of some sort of vendetta against the wealthy. I mean, there's a, there's a great deal of speculation in today's episode, Kevin. I'm assuming it's not yours, but it's just like things people have speculated. But it seems people are drawing conclusions based on very little evidence. Alternatively, maybe Jeffrey Epstein just has a lot of friends in Oakland County. Barry made one final televised plea to the killer from the police station. I don't know if you have children or if you want them. Please treat Tim the same way you would your own child. Talk to him. He's a talkative kid. I don't know if you have a brother or want one, but Kathy, Chris, and Mark said to treat him just like you would a brother. But we want him back. Please send him. Sadly, that did not happen. Six days after he had been kidnapped, a passing motorist spotted an arm poking out of the snow in a shallow ditch by a busy intersection. Like the others, Tim had been fed and cleaned, and he was wearing newly washed clothing that he had on on the day he vanished. His skateboard was found 15 feet from his body. The autopsy revealed that he died of suffocation just six hours after being found, and the killer had fed Tim his favorite meal, Kentucky Fried Chicken. Fuck your Bill of Rights. In everything that's happened so far, there was very little evidence. There was, however, a clear modus operandi. All of the children were killed and dropped off on days that it snowed. All of them were placed publicly where they would be found. During their time in captivity, all appeared to be mostly cared for, except, obviously, the sexual assault and the rope burns on the two boys. They were also abducted within one mile of Woodward Avenue between Nine Mile and 15 mile roads from this the oakland county task force released a suspect profile on the day that tim went missing some of this seems like a bit of a stretch but i'm not a detective the police said the suspect was a white male 20 to 30 years old above average intelligence and education homosexual compulsively and fanatically clean mental problems no shit on that one works a white collar nine to five job has december january off work for vacation has one family home with an attached garage has five percent of the world's population these profiles are sometimes quite incredible has no prior contact with the police and is seeing a psychiatrist the thing with all of that is as much as criminal profilers is portrayed on television and movies as sorcerers with psychic powers there's a reasonable chance the profiling is going to go the way of the polygraph test it's still thoroughly used and many swear by it but evidence suggests the profilers are only slightly better than coin flip or a random person off the street at guessing the traits of criminals yeah the polygraph thing is such nonsense if that's true i mean but profile polygraph is just nonsense right you can just ignore that it's like 51 percent accurate or something which is obviously not good enough but profiling is more of a scale thing right because you could you have a profile like this where it's like yeah his house has a garage attached to it and he's seeing a psychiatrist but then you can make another one being like he has mental problems whoa no way no way which i feel is like that's yes okay great put that down It's important to make a note of that so people know what to look for, but it's also incredibly obvious and almost certainly true. So it's like, 
a sliding scale, right? I, I feel like it should be categorized like things we definitely know, things we probably know, things that are pretty speculative, but, you know, they're just good guesses. Despite the extensive profile, there were only two bits of evidence that the police had. One was dog hairs that were found on all four bodies. Those hairs were from the same dog. Even though it was pretty clear already, this gave a conclusive link to the four slain children. The most important part of this was tying Jill to the other three, despite her gunshot wounds, or rather than suffocating like the rest. The other piece of evidence was everyone's favorite and most reliable evidence of all eyewitness testimony oh obvious sarcasm is obvious first while we're on the subject of unreliable evidence there's quite a bit of discussion about polygraph tests in this case oh here we go i love a bit of shitting on a polygraph let's go who took them and who didn't who passed and failed and what supposed expert misread the results we're going to ignore all of that because this is 2022 Ooh, no it's not it's 2023 Holy shit, it's true. how long ago was this written i do have a large stack of casual criminalists to get to so this is almost certainly written last year and i have no idea when you're watching it uh not 1977 so we know polygraphs are total bullshit, but if anyone really cares i figured i'd let you know that information so I figured I'd let you know that information is out there. If you're so inclined, don't. It's just nonsense. Instead, if you're thinking about that and you're like, oh, I can't believe Simon didn't include the polygraph test, go watch a video from a reliable, you know, educator on YouTube, maybe a scientist or something, uh, talking about polygraphs because they're just nonsense. I've probably even made a video about this, and I'm not a scientist, but, you know, I've researched what scientists say and put it in handy-dandy video form, so you're welcome. All right, back to eyewitness testimony. A woman came forward saying she saw a child talking to a man in the parking lot where Tim disappeared and that she believed the child she saw was Tim. She gave a description of the man from which a police sketch was drawn and she claimed that the car was a blue AMC Gremlin. Why would you call a cooler car Gremlin, Americans? That's a, it's just, <laughs> you, you name cars something attractive. Like, I don't know, uh, Oasis. <laughs> The Nissan Oasis. The Ford Oasis. See, that's a good car name. Gremlin sounds like, what's that car? The Quashquai or whatever? It's like, why would you call a car a Quashquai? <laughs> what is that? I don't even know how to pronounce it. Well, I don't know anything about cars. And I know people will be like, oh, Simon, that's how they say it in Korea or Japan or wherever it's from. And I'm like, well, I understand that. But also, when we, you know, take a movie and, you know, take it to another country, we adjust the name for the local market. It's normal. Uh, this gremlin had a white stripe and white wall tires. All of a sudden, the gremlin was the entire story. Pictures of the crude police sketch and the car were circulated everywhere in thousands upon thousands of flyers. So, what were the police to do with this information? According to the prosecutor of Oakland County, L. Brooks Patterson, they should stop any and every car that looks suspicious and he would take the heat for it. He said that normally to pull over a car you had to have probable cause, a phrase he stated in air quotes, but he didn't care. It's like, yeah, guys, 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 make sure you've got probable cause, all right? Wink, wink, nod, nod. Probable cause, like, oh, no, is your tail light out? <laughs> Like in the movies. And in real life. Oakland County was suspending the Fourth Amendment. Over the next few days, countless cars were pulled over, and every blue gremlin was probably pulled over several times. Do police need probable cause to pull you? I don't think the police need anything in the UK to pull you over. They could just be like, oh, and also you could just be like, oh, yeah, you touched the white line. You swerved a little bit right. You were driving a bit slow. You were driving a bit fast. You were driving a bit too safely. We're just concerned that you're, you know, under the influence because you're driving quite, you know, you're driving so safe. But it's unusual. Everyone speeds down this road, mate. Um, I don't think they need probable cause in the UK. Someone correct me if I'm wrong. I've only been pulled over once. Have I even been pulled over in the UK? I've been pulled over once here. I feel like I have been pulled over in the UK, but that's also one of those things where it's like, maybe I was just in the car when it was getting pulled over. Who knows? Let's carry on. Oh, and I got pulled over here because I was speeding and I got bloody tickets and points on my license. It was rubbish. Over the next few days, countless cars were pulled over, and every blue gremlin was probably pulled over several times. Brooks noted that while the police had little, if any, probable cause for all of these stops, there wasn't a single civilian complaint. They all just wanted to help catch the killer. Maybe that's true, or maybe it was just a world without body cam footage to tell you how people really responded. It's like everyone was super cooperative. No evidence to the contrary. 
Either way, this is America, and you can't just selectively suspend parts of the Constitution because it's convenient. If Governor Charlie Baker knocked on the door and said, Hi, we need to fumigate the barracks at handsome Air Force Base, so Staff Sergeant Sully is going to be sleeping here for the next three nights, it's my constitutional right to tell him to go f himself, and no one can take that away from me. Ultimately, for all the constitutional violations, nothing came of these searches. Years later, the blue gremlin had been largely dismissed as a hoax, a false lead, or part of a police cover up. Ooh. Ooh, spicy. There's also the chance that there was nothing nefarious and the woman who reported it was just mistaken or that the car was immediately disposed of following the thousands of flyers letting the killer know that their car had been marked. Without the car, all that was left were a few dog hairs to link the crimes, as well as one hair found on each of the male victims, though this was still about a decade before DNA evidence would first be used in any case. Still, the police were able to come up with some persons of interest because wealthy communities are apparently the breeding ground for pedophile sex rings. Oh god, <laughs> really? <laughs> like Epstein's Island? Christopher Bush In an interview decades later, Barry stated that he never blamed Tim's abduction on himself for taking his wife out to dinner that night and good on him. Yeah, I mean, I have to say, in one of those situations, it's like, I get why some people do, and I don't know, you don't know how you're going to react until you're in a situation like that. But I'm just so logically brains that I'm like, yeah, okay, obviously if I hadn't done that, this wouldn't have happened. But I also know that that's not really what's going on here. It's got to be really hard because parents in that situation will second guess every decision they've made and wonder if they'd done things differently how things would have turned out. Tim had skateboarded to the store to buy candy plenty of times without incident and even if the parents were home he probably still would have been allowed to do the same. Barry may not have blamed himself but he never gave up on trying to identify the killer. Excellent that's good like take that be logical about it be like it's not my fault and i'm going to use all of that extra energy that i've spent not worrying about me acting differently actually doing something productive like hunting your kid's murderer and then getting revenge over the decades he spent thousands of dollars on freedom of information act requests the information itself is free but you have to pay the hourly wage of whoever spends their time finding the files for you typically ranging from 25 dollars to 85 dollars per hour depending on how important the person searching is the result was over 3,400 pages of files related to the case being released to Barry, much of which he proceeded to release to the public. This is how the public found out about Christopher Bush. Chris had been in police custody shortly before Tim's disappearance on suspicion of being, suspicion of being involved with child pornography. The police had been tipped off to Chris by Gregory Green when he was arrested on child sexual assault charges. Chris and Greg, ages 26 and 27 respectively, were both charged with sexually assaulting young boys. Through the identical charges, Greg was sentenced to life in prison chris received probation yeah it's weird like whenever i think about pedophiles i always think about older people but there's no reason to think it can't be like younger people as well and i don't know i guess the police are like obviously aware of this and they're like we look at young people as well as being pedophiles it's totally possible fact boy but i don't know in my mind it's always like it's <laughs> God, it's such a stereotype, but like a middle-aged white dude with big glasses and weird greasy hair driving a panel van. <laughs> That'd be a terrible police officer. Because like some guy would come in and be like, hello, hello, how are you? Yes, doing fine. You couldn't be a pedophile, you're far too handsome. <laughs> oh, hello, Ted. You couldn't be a murderer, you're far too charming. Come, come into the police station. Have a seat. <laughs> Oh god. You are not a cop anymore. Not a cop! For the identical charges, Greg was sentenced to life in prison. Chris received probation. Wait, wasn't Greg the person who tipped him off? Chris had been in police custody. Uh had been tipped off to Chris by Gregory Green. Wait, what? So Greg's the guy who tips off that Chris is a pedo. And Greg's also or child sexual assault. Okay, so a pedo. Um wait, so Chris Gregory tips off the police that chris is also a pedo and then gregory gets life in prison and chris gets probation it should be the other way around greg should have negotiated some deal what's going on i mean they should both be in jail for a really long time to be to be honest but um that's weird how could such wildly different sentences for the same crimes possibly make sense, you ask? Well, that's easy. Michigan is home to Detroit, the Motor City, and Chris's father was an executive financial director and one of the vice presidents of General Motors. Um, f*** you, justice system. In late 1978, about 20 months after Oakland County child killer had gone dormant, Christopher Bush committed suicide. I mean, he committed suicide about as much as Jeffrey Epstein committed suicide, but that's how it was officially ruled by the police. Wow, this is, get, this is intense. 
Chris was found dead in his apartment from a gunshot wound to the head. I thought it was going to be one of those. He was found. <laughs> he committed suicide. Two gunshot wounds to the head <laughs> from behind at a distance. There were four shell casings on the floor. Uh, what? I was totally being sarcastic. What are you talking about? Four shell casings on the floor, shot right between the eyes, no gunpowder residue on his hands, and he was in bed tightly wrapped under his blankets, including his arms. Just your run of the mill in no way physically impossible suicide? Police, what are you up to? How could you possibly rule this a suicide? It's a murder. I'm like, I was just talking about being a shit detective, but this is a murder, guys. In 2012, the crime scene photos were obtained by Barry King's FOI, FOIA requests and released to the public. By this time, Chris had been ruled out as the killer by DNA evidence that we'll discuss later. However, these photos resulted in a lot of talk about a police cover-up, or at the very least, police incompetence. In Chris's room were several ropes that some claimed to be bloody ropes. Allegedly, they were also tested, there was no blood on them, and they didn't look bloody in the images I saw. But there was one Im indisputably important item in the room. On the wall was a hand-drawn picture of a boy screaming. Here is the picture he drew side by side with a photo of the first victim, Mark Stebbins. Mark was wearing a parka when he was abducted, exactly like the child in the pencil drawing is wearing. Oh my god, this picture, which Jen is going to put up on the screen, is some horror movie sh right there. Jesus Christ. People immediately picked up on how alike they looked, especially the rather unique and identifiable nose. When Michael Stebbins saw the sketch, there was zero doubt in his mind. His response was, this looks exactly like Mark being sodomized. That's uh, extremely specific. It looks just like he's in pain. God, it's creepy. This seems overly specific, and saying that it looked like Mark screaming would have sufficed, but either way, I was 1000% sure that this was a picture of his brother. Oh, and did I mention that at the time of the abductions, Chris was driving a blue Chevy Vega with white stripes? The MC Gremlins advertising campaign was basically, it's the exact same car as the Vega, it's just cheaper. Considering that Chris was a convicted child sex criminal, he was clearly known to the police since they already had him in custody shortly before Tim's disappearance, you think they might have taken him back into custody. They were already suspending people's constitutional rights, so what's the harm in keeping a sex criminal off the street for a few more days to be sure? Also, that seems like totally justified. I mean, it's circumstantial evidence, but isn't that enough to make an arrest and bring that guy in? He's got a picture of the kid on his wall screaming. What are you doing? Police, come on! If this is because the guy's guy's dad's rich, f you, f you justice system, f you hard. Hey, are you okay? There seems to be strong circumstantial evidence that Chris was involved, but the DNA evidence says he was not the killer. Then there's the subjective element. Chris's brother, in a later interview, would describe him as a fun and gregacious man who loved food, skiing, and riding his motorcycle. Others would describe him as a fat fucking slob who could barely take care of himself, let alone a child for 19 days. Because of how long the kids were held captive, the theory that there were at least two people involved went all the way back to 1977 when the crimes first started happening. This information definitely lends credence to that theory, but if Chris wasn't the killer, then who else could have been involved? Well, it looks like we'll have to investigate Michigan's wealthiest county's thriving pedophile community. Um, I know, I, I thought Kevin was joking about like these wealthy communities breeding pedophiles. I guess it like still is a joke and whatnot. But also, that seems to be. <laughs> There's a lot of weird pedo stuff happening in this community, isn't there? <laughs> North Fox Island They say that there are no original ideas left in the world, and it turns out that Jeffrey Epstein's Lolita Island is just another cheap Hollywood remake. Jerry Richards was the gym teacher at St. Joseph's Catholic School in Port Huron, Michigan, and he was a real piece of shit. He was the sort of gym teacher that was big on patting boys on the arse and being in the locker room while they showered. You know, the sort of gym teacher that none of the boys had ever experienced before or whatever again, because that shit's not normal. Yeah, if your gym teacher is doing that, they can't. I feel like teachers couldn't get away with that today because there's the internet and much more awareness about this stuff, right? Like, if that's happening, and especially like if it's on an individual basis, I feel like, you know, an adult can be very good at manipulating your kid. But when it's like this blatant group setting, surely the kids are going to be like, yo, 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 Mr. Mr. What was his name? <laughs> Mr. Richards is a bit weird, isn't he? Has he patted you on your bum? And they'll be like, yeah, yes. And then we all got naked in the showers and he was just standing there, drooling. <laughs> That's gross. I mean, Mr. Richards is going to swiftly go to prison. <laughs> 
Jerry introduced his students to a man that he referred to as his Uncle Frank. Uncle Frank was a millionaire, Francis Sheldon, a geologist and heir to a lumber fortune. Frank had outbid the state of Michigan to purchase nearby North Fox Island. The first thing he did after buying the island was to build an airstrip for his private plane. That plane would allegedly be used to ferry both Michigan's wealthy pedophiles and young boys to and from the islands. And I'll just say here, what follows is alleged because, um, well, I don't want to spoil the ending, but it's alleged. Students will be taken from the gym class to the private island with the consent of their parents as a special reward for being the top performers in class. Just don't go, please. That is super weird. If anyone's taking you to an island... <laughs> parents, if someone's taking your kids to an island somewhere, maybe send a chaperone. I'm not a pedophile. I'm a cool guy. You look more like a pedophile than anyone I've ever seen. Frank also opened a camp for young boys, named Brother Paul's Children's Mission, aka Brother Paul's Nature Camp. The island was completely covered in cameras, and everyone had to be naked at all times, because that's what people on islands do. <laughs> Again, this would be like modern day situation. If this is happening, be like, talk about this, tell someone it's it's not normal. <laughs> Not normal. I'll spare you the rest of the graphic details about what happened on that island. I only wish I could have spared myself. Oh, I'm sorry, Kevin. Suffice to say that a lot of boys were treated to what they were told was the privilege of visiting the island, where their trust and innocence were preyed on by depraved millionaires, all masterminded by a wealthy, connected, and very well-known philanthropist. And of course, the children were supplied both by that philanthropy at a fake boys' camp, as well as by at least one school teacher, the sort of person a child on the street would not consider a stranger. Oh my god, full circle to who's abducting them is someone they trust a teacher is someone they trust oh god a few weeks after tim's murder I'd, is this kevin this better be like factually proven in a court of law or i'm gonna have to go back and put some allegedly's in there because you can't just be saying like there's a millionaire island where they're like preying on children yes i'm assuming there's gonna be some admission <laughs> or some court stuff later about who was the guy the geologist dude a few weeks after Tim's murder, a psychiatrist received an anonymous letter signed only with the name Alan. Alan claimed to be a BDSM slave of the killer he called Frank. He wrote that he and Frank had served in the Vietnam War together, where Frank was traumatized by having to kill children. He had decided to take out his anger on the children of the affluent members of society who had sent people like him to war. I guess that makes sense. Kill more children. That'll make you feel better about killing children. Your brain is broken. You need to see a doctor. As always, the letter could just be a hoax. The author arranged a meeting with the psychiatrist through the newspaper classified ads, but he never showed up to the agreed-upon destination, and no more communication occurred. Frank Sheldon was also not the killer, or at least not the sole killer. First of all, that description of a war vet taking vengeance on the wealthy elite doesn't really sound like something a guy with his own private island would do. Yeah, dude, if you've got your own private island, you are the wealthy elite. These murders also took place in 1976 and 1977, but Frank fled the country in 1976 after being tipped off that the FBI were coming for him. <laughs> Jeffrey Epstein should have followed that advice. Although, where was Jeffrey? How did Jeffrey Epstein get caught? Oh, I guess he like came back and stuff. He didn't live on his like sicko island, did he? The FBI got him. <laughs> Good. If the letter was genuine, there is the possibility that the name Frank was chosen because the killer was an associate of Frank's, and they wanted to guide authorities towards Frank's known associates, of which there were many. There is also the theory that the killer may have been a victim of Frank's. Abuse has the tendency to create abusers, and the island was in operation for ten years. It's absolutely possible that the killer was either a previous associate or previous victim of Frank's, but again, there was no physical evidence other than two matching but unidentified hairs that could pinpoint a subject. A suspect, sorry. Lawson and Lamborghini. When these serial murders were taking place, they had the largest task force in American history trying to solve them. By 1979, there was only one state detective left on the case, and for a long time, nothing happened. By a long time, I mean 20 years. In 1999, they exhumed the body of one of the suspects in the case to test his DNA against the hairs that were found. DNA testing had improved dramatically, and they figured it was worth a shot. The exhumed body was not a match. The next possible break in the case wouldn't come until 2006. We're talking a quarter of a century later now. It's wild. When Richard Lawson of Detroit was arrested for murder. Interestingly, while he was in custody, he didn't want to tell, talk about his murder case at all. He wanted to talk about the Oakland County child killer. Richard didn't want to go to jail, so he started telling everybody. He had been part of a child sex ring of five people out of Detroit. Richard divulged a lot of information, much of which, he said, was known to the police, but had never been released publicly, but he had a lot of good new information as well. While leaving the courthouse one day, he told reporters that he knew who the murderer was, but he wouldn't 
tell them because he wanted to make a deal. No deal was made and he was sentenced to life in prison for the murder, with an additional 28 counts of child sexual assault being added for later prosecution. Uh, this feels... I mean, I don't want to give that guy a deal because he's a murderer and also a child predator. Um, but I also feel like it's a bit suspicious the police weren't willing to make some sort of deal. And especially as there does seem to be like stuff being hidden here, right? And about the executives guy only getting probation or whatever, it does seem that there was some amount of police corruption going on. In Richard's naming of names, he implicated the only other living member of their five-person sex ring, a man he called Ted Orr. When police failed to find anyone with that name, he told them he believed the guy's real last name was Lamb something. Not long after, the police picked up Theodore Lambergine. Police didn't believe that either of these men was the killer, particularly as they were based out of Detroit. It's only a half-hour drive from Detroit to Oakland County, but these pedophile rings probably have turf cut out the same way gangs do or something like that. Is this... I like to think that this is more just like a... a, a you know, not a one-off occurrence. Obviously, there are weird pedophile rings, but I don't imagine they have, like, turf cut up. Like, I don't imagine, like, where I'm sitting right now, there's, like, some pedophile ring that owns this territory <laughs> for pedophilia. That would be kind of disturbing and by kind of disturbing i mean wholeheartedly disturbing they may have not been the killer but because they were reasonably close to oakland county and because richard had so much good information authorities thought it was likely that these men could know who the real killer was ted was taken into custody and charged with 19 counts of sexually assaulting children the police hoped they'd been able be able to lean on him to get information out of him they offered him a deal in exchange for cooperation in a remarkable turn of events the police had never seen before, Ted didn't consider the deal for a moment. He immediately pled guilty to all 19 counts, including three life sentences, without saying a word. Oh my lord. That does feel like some omerta gang sh**. He's like, no, 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 I'd rather go to prison forever than squeal. It's still not evidence, but the police felt this was extremely telling. These Detroit pedophiles weren't rich and connected like the Oakland County types. They almost definitely had the information the police needed, but they had been able to live their disgusting criminal lives for 40 years without any repercussion. It seemed almost certain that they had known to remain silent in exchange for decades of operating without scrutiny, and now that they were in custody, they had to pay back those years of protection. Sure, Richard had been quite talkative, but aside from ratting out his partner, he didn't give any actionable information. All of the intel that he gave was solid, but it was all about people who were dead, or about Frank, who had fled the country and at this point was presumed to be dead, most likely dying around 1996 in Amsterdam. They were the most promising suspects the case had seen in 30 years, but it still amounted to nothing. The last reports I could find are that both men are serving life sentences, but that's a few years ago, so with any luck, they're now dead. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> the third hair. Archibald Edward Sloan was, surprise, surprise, a child molester. Seven years after Timothy King's death, Archibald was arrested and charged with two counts of first-degree criminal sexual conduct. In January 1985, he was sentenced to life in prison, where he remains to this day. With him already in jail for life, it kind of makes sense that Archibald would no longer be pursued as a lead. For whatever reason, in, in 2009 and 1966, Pontiac Bonneville that belonged to Archibald was searched. Inside the car, they found a hair. That hair was a DNA match for the hairs found on Mark and Tim's bodies. Finally, there was a new suspect, a new suspect whose DNA did not match the hairs found. God damn it. There are frequent references to the Michigan pedophile community throughout this investigation. It was seen that they really were a community. Not only did they have their own private island and use power and influence to protect one another, but Archibald would also loan out his car to people for whatever they wanted. Fortunately, a match did turn up for the hair. Investigators pointed to James Vincent Gunnels, the DNA match, as the best lead there had ever been in the decades-long search for the killer. When he was approached by news reporters who asked to interview him outside of his home, he shocked them by actually agreeing to talk. In James's own words, my heart goes out to those families. It really, really does. I don't feel they were served justice through any of this. They were definitely not served justice, but why would he even talk to the press? Not only that, when he was brought in by police, why did he ask to be allowed to speak to Barry King, who was still very publicly pursuing the case? Barry was hesitant, but law enforcement said that sometimes criminals feel remorse and will confess things to the victim's families. It was a long shot, but they felt it was worth it. Barry and his son Chris met with James, but James did not confess. Barry felt that the story James told him was believable. It wasn't some absurd, off-the-wall fantasy, but it did contradict statements he'd made over 30 years earlier. The meeting did little to clear anything up, and it is believed that James knows a lot more about what happened. Than he wanted to say. If you're wondering why on earth James wasn't charged with the crimes if he was a DNA match for all three hairs found, there's some bad news on that front. 
Except for at the very root of the hair. Hair only contains mitochondrial DNA, not nuclear DNA. Mitochondrial DNA is much shorter, and therefore it cannot be used to pinpoint a specific person with a huge degree of accuracy. It's also only passed down by the mother, not both parents, meaning the mitochondrial DNA of a woman and all her offspring will be the same, and there's only a slight chance of variation. Think about extending that by 10, 20, or 50 generations, and you've probably figured out the problem. Yeah, it's just you'll get too many people. The odds of having a random person matching a sample of nuclear DNA, assuming no contamination or anything, are about 1 in 70 trillion. That's pretty conclusive. The odds of a random person matching a sampling of mitochondrial DNA are about 1 in 150. Not 150 million or something, just 1 in 150, which is reasonable doubt. James's mother and brother would have matched, as would hundreds of thousands of other res residents of Michigan. This by itself would not be nearly enough to charge him with a crime. No, but it's a damn good reason to go look for some other evidence, isn't it? Even using it as part of a larger picture, though, it unfortunately doesn't do much. James has a long history of property crime, but he has never been charged with any crimes of a sexual nature. He was also 15 to 16 years old during the course of the three murders. This would make it unlikely that he was the killer, as there's seemingly no way he could have kept someone kidnapped and taken care of for 19 days. It could, however, make him an accomplice. Dude. He could be the... the person they trusted, like, not the teacher, but we were talking about another kid. I don't you know. Especially as it known he had interacted with Christopher Bush before Chris definitely committed suicide. As a teenager, James would have been another sort of person that would likely not be seen by children as a stranger. As for the nature of the interactions between James and Chris, police have stated that James was sexually abused by Chris, as was James's younger brother. So the best piece of evidence that has ever existed in this case is borderline useless DNA that connects to a man that was 16 years old at the time of the crimes and is a known victim of abuse by one of the people who is suspected to be involved in the case. Fantastic. Yes. Yeah, this you can um, a defense lawyer would have a field day with this. There's only one other piece of vaguely incriminating evidence against James that I could find any reference to. I cannot find the actual recording, but according to a memo prepared by Barry King, one of his FOIA requests include FOIA? Is that shortened to FOIA or is it FOIA? Included a conversation between James and his sister while he was in prison. She asked him about one hair found on the victims, and his answer was, I wasn't there when it happened. Oh, wow. So, I mean, it's not an admission, but it is like a, um, I was involved somehow. Like, otherwise you'd say, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> That's potentially incriminating, but it's hardly proof of anything. Yet again, it's something a defense lawyer would have a field day with. As I can't find the recording or transcript anywhere, we also have to take Barry's word for it. It's easy to be skeptical of information and theories from the family, as they're often too close to the case. But personally, I believe Barry remains remarkably level-headed throughout over 40 years of investigation into the murders. So I'll take him as, at his word. Yeah, and if he's also started putting out fake information and not getting it right, then people aren't going to take him seriously, and he wants to be taken seriously. I trust Barry's info. Wrap up. There's nothing even close to a happy ending here. Barry King died in 2020 at the age of 89 without ever knowing who killed his son, despite tirelessly dedicating himself to the case for 43 years. And when all is said and done, all we have is a loose theory. It is believed James Gunnels may have been used as a lure. Either he could have been groomed by Chris Bush, or he simply went along with it to avoid potentially suffering more abuse. From there, Chris brought the kidnapped children to someone. We don't really know who. There were a lot of sex criminals in this story, and they all seem to have either been involved or knew the people that were, but they aren't talking and there's no physical evidence. Then there's Chris's suicide. He may have killed himself because he was seen as a liability. <laughs> Killed. He's so murdered, dudes. What the f Someone who could crack under pressure. Maybe he thought someone would realize that the gremlin they had spent years chasing was actually his vega and he wanted to tie up that loose end. And what of Jill and Christine? All of the child abusers in today's story targeted boys, and the girls seemed to be well taken care of until their deaths. There was no rope burns or other signs of being restrained like with the boys, and they had not been sexually assaulted. There seemed to be a clear motive for kidnapping the boys that wasn't present with the girls. It also isn't clear why one of the girls was shot when the other three were all suffocated. We may never be able to answer any of these questions. Barring a surprise deathbed confession by one of the people involved, it doesn't seem that there's anywhere the answers can come from. Well, that's it. That wraps up our story today. Thank you for listening or watching. It's extremely depressing. People were murdered. We don't really know who did it. And um, yeah, leave a review if you enjoy this show. Uh, like, subscribe if you're on YouTube. And thanks for watching.